I love that we are now more focused on the human element, right? Like it's no longer about like transactional situations in the bear market. Like, yo, give me the alpha. What's the project? What's this? What's that? But now we're asking ourselves like, yo, hey, how are you doing, man? How are you how are you feeling, right? Like the mental health conversation is really something that communities have been really pointing around bear markets because we were just so busy trying to secure the bag, trying to make that flip, trying to get onboard people that we really didn't slow down and ask ourselves, hey, how are we really doing, right? And so we start seeing communities be birthed out of this and really prioritizing that, right? And so I love that the conversation has been going to like, how do we build sustainable humans, right? And make sure that the human element of this economy is taken care of before we address the tech, before we address the bags, before we address the next PFPs and things of that capacity. Gentlemen, host chat round two. It's We're been, back. We're uh, back. Just under a year. I think we did this at the uh, near the end of 2021, and I think uh, it's been been a wild ride for us all. Excited to dive in with you guys. Yeah, how, how basically, have you been? basically a decade ago. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> web three years. Yeah. That's for I sure. I had shorter hair. You know, that's right. Right? like. Like what? what I had fewer grays personally. You know, yeah, I probably had more more I, sleep hours. I stayed inside. exactly the same. We, we, we don't age over here. Bro. That's right. Sam, <laughs> Sam is unbothered by the bear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, obviously lots has happened. I think let's jump right into it. I know obviously it's uh, the at the time of our last host chat, we in full on bull run. It's been a, a bear market, no doubt about it. Um, but I think there's actually lots of blessings with the bear. So I'm very curious, like what stood out to you as some of the the pros of this bear market? What are some of like the the great forcing functions that it's brought us? Well, one thing that comes to mind is like it's often said bear markets are for builders. It's really true. You know, like when you're out there building, uh, there's so much noise during a bull market. There are so many shiny objects. Like there's it's so easy to get distracted, even if you are relentlessly focused on what you're building. It's just it's a crazy landscape to navigate. I can tell you that a lot of the builders I've spoken to actually feel a sense of relief, uh, you know, because there's a bit less noise. They're able to hone in. You're able to put your head down and really build. And the other thing Thing too is that bear markets shake out the speculators and the bad actors and the scammers and people who are really just in the space for the wrong reasons, looking to make a quick buck and not looking to actually create value. Um, so what you get is a quieter context where uh, you can actually connect and and collaborate with people who are really in it for the long haul, who are really in it for the right reasons. And that's not to say that making money isn't the right reason. I'm just saying like you know, what we're not seeing right now are the cookie cutter PFP projects, the essentially like NFT equivalent of ICOs just like popping up left and right. Like, you know, the the, the scammers scamming 70 million out of the, out of the ecosystem. My like, nervous system's still recovering from those words. Yeah, though. <laughs> yeah. Like, like this is a quieter time and that's actually a blessing in its own way. Yeah, man, I think you, you bring up some excellent points. And on top of that, what I love about the bear market is the camaraderie that it, it, it actually nurtures, right? Like everybody in a bull market is so focused on securing their bag or launching their own product or launching their own thing that we don't slow down for proper partnerships and dialogue between companies, right? Or organizations or projects. And I think that what the bear market is now doing is like, how can we cross pollinate, right? How do we how do we create value beyond our brand? How do we partner with the right people and the right projects with the right creatives to actually start innovating, right? And start pushing the boundaries and experimentation is actually welcomed, right? So like failure is something that in a bull market gets kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, they failed, whatever, fuck it. And they get ignored. But failure in a bear market, it's like, how can we improve it? How can we like, how can we like, make this better. Here's the community. Here's how we could, we would solve this together. Here's those things. So I'm starting to see a lot more collaboration, um, not only on Twitter, but within our communities as well, especially from founder to founder, people are asking themselves questions as like, how do we navigate this? What's the building that we're doing? And I think more further to speak to a technical analysis aspect of it is like, we're now building the, the pipes underneath that's going to build, right? Like we're not just looking at it from, um, decentralized exchange perspective or a PFP perspective or an NFT perspective, we're now asking ourselves, like, what is the infrastructure that's required for this industry and this economy to have sustainability beyond what it is today? So, for example, looking at 
what is the future of finance going to look like within the NFT world or within the Web3 world and laying down those pipes, right? What is the future of communication going to look like? What is the future of decentralized, you know, collaboration? The, 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 word, the world of DAOs is starting to really start creating some a lot of like really great infrastructure for that to happen. And so I'm just really, really excited to see both the experimentation and the collaboration that's going to rebirth from this bear market. Yeah, for sure. No, just to, to build on some of the stuff you guys brought up, like I think undoubtedly incredibly healthy for the space. I think there's um, like there's even people I've talked to that are now coming into the space that have been through crypto cycles and are like, I don't even like to engage and really build during the bull markets because there's just so much noise. Like literally, I'm only interested in like contributing to the space during these downturns because that's when there's a lot less noise. And I think some of the noise that I'm, I'm grateful has kind of been flushed out of the landscape a little bit is that like there undoubtedly was a lot of market volume and a lot of projects that core fundamentals were the greater fool theory. There's no denying it. There was a lot of projects whose price was like, yeah, community, but like literally community for community's sake and community built around like price go up, like when Lambo. Um, I think that is not the long-term potential of this, of the, the merit of this technology. I think um, we've said this multiple times, but fundamentally redefining how creators, communities, brands go about growing, engaging, and rewarding their communities and kind of sharing in the success and growth with their community. Um, so I, I think it's, it's created this forcing function saying, let's get like the, if you are creating a community for community's sake, and if your core value proposition is financial speculation, like those times have come and gone. Like that's not going to work. Instead, we really need to focus on like, what is like the legitimate value proposition we want to create for our communities? What is the the core communal values we want to bring together? And I think those are the projects that even if floor prices have gone down a little bit, like engagement overall hasn't really taken a hit, which is like, a, a, I think a, a true stamp of like what will be a sustainable community in the space. I also think too, it's a, we had a, a podcast with Fuck Render, um, incredible artist, and he brought up a really fascinating point. He's like, I almost think like NFTs blew up too fast. Like the mainstream perception of NFTs is so misconstrued to the actual merit and potential of the technology. And um, I think that is like, we, we need credible projects um, to actually influence and educate culture in, in meaningful and inspiring and, and uh, create intrigue rather than um, what a lot of other more mainstream media is, is trying to just like be opportunistic and cash in on a, on a headline that ends up misportraying the space and creating these these big misunderstandings that have people write it off rather than really dive into to, to learn more. So think it's uh it's, it's healthy it's a long road but it's, it's a fun road to be on for sure totally yeah. and, and we saw this with crypto we saw this all happen you know 2013 2016 like like it this is this is the same exact cycle yeah. like we've seen this movie before yeah. and we know how it ends yeah like history doesn't repeat itself exactly. but it does rhyme yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> and honestly if you look back at the adoption of, of many new and disruptive technologies there were always you know bubbles there were look at the look at the dot com bubble there were always you know uh you know misconstrued headlines and things blown out of proportion and people fear what they don't understand and new technology is something Thing that many people can't wrap their heads around. Um, this is a huge opportunity for people like us that are interested in education, that are interested in helping people understand why this technology is so disruptive and the potential that it holds. I think from that perspective, man, it's like, I just want to bring an example up. Like when credit cards first got introduced, the number of fraud on credit cards is like in the, in the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, even today in this age. But no one's talking about, oh my God, look, billions of dollars in fraud and credit card. And no one's like, worried about their credit card, right? Like everybody, we all have our credit cards in our hand, but there's still these things happening. So similarly to us, we're graduating into that development of what is gonna be the protections that we're gonna provide the retail investors and also the institutional investors that are putting their money into our economy, right? I, I don't, I know, I wanna reframe speaking about the technology to now speaking to it as, a, as an economy, right? Because we're now getting to a certain point of climax of investment dollars that we're now just seeing this become its own wheels, right? The flywheel effect is not stopping from here. But I think to your point, Sam, I wanna bring something up that's more collectively around community that's really important. I love that we're now more focused on the human element, right? Like it's no longer about like transactional situations in the bear market, like, yo, give me the alpha. What's the project? What's this? What's that? But now we're asking ourselves like, yo, hey, how are you doing, man? 
how are you how are you feeling right like the mental health conversation is really something that communities have been really pointing around bear markets because we were just so busy trying to secure the bag trying to make that flip trying to onboard people that we really didn't slow down and ask ourselves hey how are we really doing like have i slept have i drank water today like when was the last time i ate i know those were questions i asked myself during the bull market right that today in the bear i'm actually more intentional about that right and so we start seeing communities be birthed out of this and really prioritizing that right and so i love that the conversation has been going to like how do we build sustainable humans Mm-hmm. right and make sure that the human element of this economy is taken care of before we address the tech before we address the bags before we address the next pfps and things of that capacity what are your thoughts on like what's going on in the space in mental health and our and our communities yeah well look like let's be real the nft space has all the recipe for a mental health crisis like life-changing money on the line with crazy market volatility, social media addiction across multiple platforms, the like ever-present specter of FOMO that's just like, if you're not on at this point, you're going to miss out and all your friends are going to like, are going to gain this thing. Like, like these hold these feelings. And from an artist perspective, seeing your like works not sell while you see all these other people work, work sell has a has a detrimental effect on your self esteem. Um, not being able to trust, you know, is this a, is this a real project? Is this a rug pull? Like the fact that that you know these things often happen uh, overnight. Like the mints were happening overnight. They're happening on weekends. This space does not uh, like uh, adhere to Monday through Friday, right? It takes no time off. And it's really easy to feel like you're caught up in that wave, to feel overwhelmed, to feel like you're, if you're not, if you're not there, you're going to miss out. And that's not healthy. That's not healthy. And, um, you know, I'm glad that we are creating a space uh, more often where we can destigmatize that and speak to it um, because, you know, a lot of people feel intimidated about speaking out about that. Um, They're just they're just trying to go with the flow and just trying to keep up with something that you just can't keep up with. You know, it's our job to keep up with the NFT space and it's still too much for us to keep up with all the time. Right. And so I think what we got to do is normalize the idea of unplugging, normalize the idea of accepting the fact that like you're going to go dark for a weekend. You might miss a mint. That's okay. That's okay. You know, like the normalizing, setting boundaries on your social media use, you know, that's way easier said than done when Twitter and Discord and all of these platforms are so critical to uh, success in the space. But at the end of the day, like putting it human first instead of profit first, uh, I think is a perspective we all need to adopt. For sure. I mean, I I don't necessarily have all the answers, but what's been helpful in my life is, yeah, kind of building on that, but creating some sense of boundaries, making sure you don't let your complete identity get engulfed in your work and in Web3 and making sure you're able to um, spend legitimate time with yourself, with other people that you care about that have shared interests beyond just this world. I think just having a diversity of, of perspective um, enables you to even just bring greater perspective to how you engage in this space. But yeah, Here's how you think too. I think for me, from this perspective, man, what I'm loving is also how the mental health and the wellness community are starting to really embrace uh, NFTs and Web3, right? Like I love, as, as you guys probably know, I'm very vocal about uh, psilocybin use for uh, microdosing and for mental health. And you're starting to see- You knew the plug was coming <laughs> at some point in this episode, bro. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had a timer, actually. Yeah, that really, actually. <laughs> late, actually. Yeah, 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 late, a little bro. bit, bro. The, the, the mushroom crowd will have a word. After, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I should have dropped it first. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry, buddy. It's like, I think we're starting to see really sustainable communities, right? That, that are really embracing the psychedelic revolution that's occurring and saying, hey, how does technology culture and the plant medicine community start implementing themselves? And we start seeing that very actively in our culture, being more openly about that aspect and being saying like, hey, you know what? I do deal with anxiety, right? Like I, there's days that I wake up with crippling anxiety and I still have to move forward, right? Because it's it's just a, the ambition, right? It's who I am as a person. So having these, these tools and having these communities that we can actually speak to things and know the exact same language, right? So um, I think we were yesterday, we were having a conversation on Twitter spaces and we were, we were asked about like, what has Web3 really taught you about yourself, right? And one of the things that we said was like how in Web3 in the NFT communities, we no longer have to compartmentalize 
each part of our personalities, right? Like before I would have to speak to my psychedelic community and like that's the only thing I could speak to them about, right? Like in my tech community, I can only speak to them about fundraising and tech and the stuff, like what's the new tool and what's the new this, right? And then talking to my friends, social circles about music and EDM would be like at the club and that's it, right? So, but now like all my different parts, my spirituality, my emotionality, my intellectuality, my sexuality, all these different parts are coming together into this community where I could be at the club speaking to the person about NFTs and that same person as we're walking out tell them that I've had a stressful day and that it was really great to see them and I appreciated them and also speak to them did you get that new crypto dick butt that that, that was really dope I saw your new dick butt right so it's like having that ability to share the same common language without having to compartmentalize has been a game changer for me and so many others that I speak to in this space and I'm just really excited to see what the psychedelic community is going to do from a perspective of technology revolution and also mental health revolution. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And just to, I mean, in this vein of, um, I mean, there's the mental health side, but another thing just around the the human side of this whole equation, I do just want to bring it back also when it comes to just like human-centered design. Mm -hmm. Um, I think in the past 20, 30, 50 years, like design thinking, um, really having empathy and customer empathy at the forefront of what you're building. And when you're driving innovation, I think is like a a critical foundation. I think there's, and this is kind of just abstracting as an area of opportunity as we are in this building phase is really like people dialing into customer empathy. Who are they trying to serve? So often when there's new technologies that come about, people just try and create and build ideas because they think it's a great idea or or building just for the sake of building. I think a lot of the noise too in the space was that um, it wasn't actually solving problems that were big pressing problems. Oftentimes too, it was... um, uh, not necessarily having that same sense of focus. So I think as as people are going into this next wave, I think making sure that you really are dialing deep into your, your customers' desires, existing customer pain points. It's not about creating these new desires. It's about cre- eliminating some of the friction of them already getting some of their, uh, like actualizing some of their desires. So I think- I love yeah. that. I love that human-centric design. Like, is there any particular area that you have seen that has really- promoted that or a project or a community or something along those lines is like I fully agree with you and I'd love to get your perspective on yeah. like if anyone's doing it from I a think, great point. I think the Royal and the way in which Royal and Blau has crafted their value proposition is a pristine model. And I think in doing so, he's put a lot of the blockchain tech at the in the, the back where the selling point isn't the technology, but the selling point is like invest in an artist, enjoy the, the ride of their success. And I think that goes to the same level of, of just general fan psychology of all fans wanting to be very early on an artist and even celebrating that as part of their identity. So there's already a sense of like vested interest and support to date pre this, this true ownership. It's really just been like social and like people will make sure you know that, yeah, I was listening to him. Like, tell you, I'm glad you finally came around. Yeah. Um, but, but now for people to actually have this opportunity to invest in, and share in the success of their artists over time, like that's the value proposition. That's tapping into the desire and at the forefront of their value proposition. The, like they don't even mention Web3, they don't mention NFTs. They're, they're truly dialed in to that core goal, that, that core desire from the customers that they're setting out to, to serve rather than just getting so caught up with all these different angles they could take and all these different random features they can add. It, it's just this super distilled value proposition that nails the need of the the customers they're trying to serve. What about you, Matt? Yeah, it's really interesting. So I think what's been really interesting to watch has been the rise of like the CCO movement in Ooh, uh, in NFTs, yeah. like Creative Commons, you know, putting things in public domain. Um, we saw that with Nouns and, and Punk 4156. We saw that with Cryptodes. I think Cryptodes was like a, a really great example of like an early like community project that took off because it had it was based on values, you know, and uh, and it became this tight knit, really, really positive but uh, community. But they were about something more than, like we said, number go up. Right. And now we, we saw MFers. We've seen we've seen others start to adopt that. I mean, just last week, X Copy uh, announced that he was making all of his artwork and CCO, which is a massive a massive deal considering this is the blue chip crypto artist. Would have been unthinkable in the traditional art world for you know uh, one of these blue chip artists to make all of their artwork public domain. But but it's with the understanding that. Uh, memes are powerful and that by entrusting this type of IP with the public, you can actually uh, foster more creativity and, and, and actually benefit from a much wider reach. 
you know, rather than keeping it as like a walled garden, super siloed and exclusive. It's like everybody can use this. Everybody can can make their ideas of this. Everyone can spread this out to the world. But at the end of the day, it's all going to draw like value back to the original. And it's a different way of thinking about ownership and IP rights and the like. And I, I really think like the CCO community is a values based community that is going to have staying power. I love that. And I want to dive deeper into something that happened after we had our last one and uh, a step below CCO, right? Ownership of your IP rights. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about Yugo Labs buying CryptoPunks and MeBits. That was that shook the market, right? That was like a huge move, right? Oh, yeah. Like the established player with the new the underdog coming in and taking it over, right? That freed up the CryptoPunks from the IP rights and gave it to the owners to be able to use it as they see fit. Like, what are what are we thinking about that acquisition? And let's think about it from a macro perspective for, first, and then we can go into the micro. The underdog buying the first project, the first PFP project. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean it's fascinating, right? Because uh, it obviously it was polarizing. You know, some some punk owners, uh, you know, uh, applauded it. Some, you know, felt like it was a corporate takeover and the like. You know, it, it's really interesting. Um, what I think uh, what I think is really interesting to see is the fact that, um, you know, crypto punks, you know, to me, like their, their value is almost grandfathered in, right? Like they, they're, they're, you know, they're not the first NFT project, certainly, but I would, I would be hard pressed to find one that has been more influential, uh, just it, at this state of, of being in terms of dictating and, and, and shaping market trends. Um, and so what's interesting, oh, no, man, Dinosaur butt feet are pretty high. There, which... <laughs> you raise a very, a very, very valid point. We'll, we'll, we'll take this offline. Yeah. But, but you know, so but what's interesting is you know when you look at like like Board Ape Yacht Club, like they even used a lot of different traits from CryptoPunks. Like it was in in many ways an homage to it, and to see uh, you know like you said what was kind of like the underdog uh, upstart eventually come up and now acquire you know the ones that they looked up to, the master. Um, it is a it was a it was a development that shook the space to its core. Uh, I think the fact that commercial rights are being extended to punks holders and mebits holders uh, is a good thing for the space. Uh, I, I do think that there are a lot of legitimate concerns on the, uh, the, the part of punks holders. It's like, you know, how are they going to do right by the IP? Uh, are they going to be fair? Like, are they, you know, there's a joke like, we don't want like crypto punks on lunch boxes. And, you know, and of course that joke became a meme. And now right. there's a contingent that do want lunch, lunch, lunch boxes. I, I, and, I, I actually, know. I do want my lunch. <laughs> well, we'll talk to, to Noah, Noah right? Yeah. We'll talk to, but but I, I will say that, you know, having having worked with Noah, uh, and, you know, and, and partnered with him at, when he was at Christie's, um, and, you know, I, I do think punks are in good hands with him. Oh, amazing hands. Yeah. And Noah we trust. And Noah yeah, we trust. Yeah, Noah we trust, um, you know. And, and, you know, it is really interesting. Uh, it, it will be interesting to see as we go forward, um, you know, how that balance looks. Uh, because, you know, the value propositions for these two projects are quite different. You know, Board Ape Yacht Club is based on that idea of the, you know, community-based utility in the form of airdrops, in the form of access to ApeFest, in the form of, you know, uh, this this metaverse world, other uh, other world that they're building, um, you know, and all that. And with CryptoPunks, it's it's a bit of a different value proposition. It's history. It's legacy. It's, it's owning a piece of internet history. Um, and you have to steward these different projects and they're like the priorities from from which their, their collector base uh, uh, evaluates evaluates the project and also the priorities of of the of the new management uh, and, and see just like where those align. Um, it'll be it'll be an interesting year, I think, for for all these projects. Yeah, man. I think you bring up with some excellent points around that, you know. And I, I think polarizing things are the things that move markets forward, right? Like polarizing thoughts, polarizing opinions, polarizing you know inventions are the things that really move the markets forward. And I, like what I loved about that acquisition is how many traditional investors, right, venture capitalists and other institutionals came into the marketplace and started seeing these communities as viable returns on investment, right? Mm -hmm. Like we saw Andreessen Horowitz going into Yugo Labs, right? And they're also investing in BeFriends, right? We're starting to see Animoca brands starting to invest strategically in the space from our infrastructure play all the way to the community play. But I wanna take it a little bit deeper, right? We saw this acquisition and then the bear market hit Right. And then we started seeing the concepts of free mints, goblins. Yeah. Holy shit. Did they take the fucking movement by storm? Right. Because at NFT NYC, they activated hardcore and there was a free mint 
and it was crazy the community mind you i'm not a fan of the art i just want to be fully clear not my thing you know even when i had the opportunity i just didn't like the art so that's one of the things that actually per, like prohibits me to move forward but i just love what caesar and dave and everybody there at, at Trust is a truth. It's truth, a truth. Yeah, yeah a truth are building because they really showcase the power of community. Like, what are some of the things that you saw from that mint that kind of stood up to you? The one, my big takeaway from that was like, never underestimate the power of memes and people having fun. Like, mm. even in the depths of the bear market, like, people were having fun. They were jumping in these spaces. They were making goblin sounds. Like, the first time, it's funny, like, the first time I, I like, came across it, I was like, what the hell is this? Like, what is going on? I, I I lasted like five seconds in the space and like tweeted about that. And a bunch of goblins like started like talking shit on the, but like, fu like, like good natured shit on the, yeah, on yeah. the, on the, on the timeline. And then like, I started to see what was happening and like the sort of like mimetic language they were using, how they were stylizing things. I was like, this is, this is, you know, this is, this is an experience team and, and, and they're doing something really smart. And obviously, you know, it was, people didn't know who was behind it, which contributed to the intrigue. Um, but you know, like it, it, I remember like when they did another one of their big spaces, um, I jumped on and I like, I made myself kind of like listen to it. And what I heard was just like a lot of people coming together and having fun at, at a time when like from a macro standpoint, like the NFT space was not in a great spot, not in a good spot, like liquidity down, uh, you know, floor prices crashing, a lot of uncertainty, you know, the fear or greed meter, it's fully on fear, but like people were still coming together and having fun. And that's a really underrated aspect and you can't fake that, you know? And, and, and that was like, it was really interesting to watch that. It reminded me uh, and this has been said before, but it reminded me of the early days of Board Ape Yacht Club when people were just like popping into clubhouse rooms because it was clubhouse back then. Yeah, making making the sound, making the monkey sounds, and like like changing their profile pics, and like nobody at that moment ever thought that that project was going to turn into what it did. Um, and, and anyone who who tells you that they knew that was going to happen is lying because there was just no way to know that then. Um, and, and there was a similar sort of like like grassroots, um, like mimetic, organic, like like. Uh, what's the word like? Um, oh, it's a cult. Yeah, 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 like a cult. cult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like that wasn't what I was looking yeah. for, but I'll take it. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that, that just came together on this project, and and what'll be really interesting to see is, you know, obviously, they, they, you know, uh, Truth did reveal themselves as the creator, which I think was a good move for the long term uh, value of it. But it, it, it'll be interesting to see, like, you know, how they kind of like keep the mystique and the and the magic alive. It did turn into this whole free mint meta that then also kind of like ran its course in certain ways. Um, you know, I, it, it's it, it's interesting to to kind of watch how that all played out. Um, but I, I think it also just goes to show that even in the depths of a bear market, if you bring imagination to the table, if you bring something different to the table, and if you can really activate a community around something that is fun and that, and that like they enjoy being a part of, like, remember when like we grew up playing video games, we didn't do that for money. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, we spent <laughs> hours playing video games that we paid for and literally got no financial return. It was because it was fun. Like, never underestimate the World power of, of that. that. Yeah, was so much fun. So dude. much fun. And so, what what I'm looking for went, went deep down the road. Sacrificed like a solid three weeks of my life <laughs> <Yeah>. exclusively <laughs> to that game. Do you know how many times I beat Ocarina of Time? Like, I had to beat it for my friends, and I enjoyed it. I was like, oh, I can beat it for you. Yeah, yeah. You, you stuck, guys know how many stuck times on the I water temple again? I disconnected right. my parents' yeah. phone just to make sure they wouldn't pick it up so I could play. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> but but again, it's like. You know, that's what I'm looking for this bear market. Yeah. I'm looking for people who are having fun, building, innovating, coming together, creating community that is based on something more than just like the number going up and making money. It's about coming together and it's about being creative. So what do you think? Like, I, I wanted to just kind of abstract a bit and build on some of these awesome principles you're alluding to um where i mean there's this notion of like crossing the chasm right and that's kind of gone like if there's the innovation diffusion graph which is like innovators early adopters early majority late majority late adopters and laggards i mean right now we're in the like innovators early adopters phase the crossing the chasm is like going from like late early adopters into early uh, early majority so um, what do you think are some of the most important things that collectively we all really focus on uh, as different builders in all facets of the space that we're all really intentional about as, as we collectively are trying to be the, the rising shy that live li the rising tide that lifts all ships and cross the chasm? Look, from that perspective, we just need to 
focus on making sure that the, the the smart, intelligent people have the resources to build, right? And make sure that the blockers are there to n- not distract them from actually sustaining that value, right? And like, and not dismissing ideas. I think crossing the chasm is also about allowing things to breathe, right? It doesn't mean like, let's go charge the chasm. It could be a walk across it, right? It doesn't have to be this big bang movement. It could actually be this soft, quiet moment that all of a sudden is a little bit and then all at once, right? And so from that perspective, it's just really about making this as simple as possible for the everyday consumer to adopt it, right? I think for us, we're still very much in the phase of like, the MetaMask, the transfer, where do I buy ETH and transfer it over, the hot wallet to the hardware wallet to the security, am I signing, am I revoking, am I looking at the right contract? Like all these things are still very much as austeric and very overwhelming to the everyday consumer. So like as long as we make it super simple, right, that simplicity is going to be the key to it. And I think simplicity arises from allowing the smart, intelligent people to give them the resources and get out of their way. Because at so many different times, there are going to be these elements where people kind of start coming into and disrupting those who are actually creating uh, the technologies. And so coming back to that is let's not be dismissive of new technologies. Let's not be dismissive of new ideas, right? Because like I I found myself, I'm guilty of this. A new project comes up or a new idea. I'm like, oh, that's not going to work out. And then all of a sudden it's like a $200 million project. And I'm like, oh, shit. Oh, okay, cool. Right. So it's like, let's make let's give things room to breathe. And I think that will naturally help us cross the chasm. Yeah, um, I have some thoughts there as well. I think that like, you know, I think you bring up a great point. There's so much friction currently from to go from interest to onboard, right? I even saw anecdotally with my friends trying to get my friends into NFTs, many of whom I knew would thrive in the space. And they're like, cool, I know you're passionate about this. I'm here for it. And then it would be like, oh, like I'm waiting on like, you know, whatever centralized exchange to like get the money from my bank. And like now it's held up for two weeks. And how do I set up a MetaMask? What do I do with that? Now I can't even make that drop that originally interested me. Like, like it, it's just so difficult. There's so much friction right now. And we live in uh, an attention economy where people are not going to pay a ton of attention on things that are really hard to do. And so a lot of people lose interest. They'll, they'll lose the spark. They'll, they'll get distracted. Like the fact that it takes so many steps to get from point A to point B, uh, I think is something that we absolutely have to change from a usability UX perspective. We need to make it simpler. We need to make it easier and we need to make it safer uh, for people to, to, to engage with this space meaningfully. A lot of those friends eventually, you know, got into it and they thrived just as I thought they would, but it took months and, and it shouldn't have taken that. It should have taken like milliseconds, you know? Yeah. For Absolutely. Sure, for sure. What do you think is going to cross the chasm? Because you, you yeah. uh, like one of the things, Sam, that I really appreciate about you, man, is like you have this ability or this gift that I've seen over the course of like our eight year friendship that somehow this motherfucker finds himself two steps ahead of culture. I don't know how he does it. I don't know where he gets it from, but he has a finger on the pulse. <laughs> I'm, I'm out here playing chess. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, and it was, again, it was the two of you who red-pilled me into NFTs. I always say, I didn't choose NFTs. NFTs chose me, and it was because of you two. You guys were the, like, you guys are my culture barometers, right? So, like, what is your perspective from that standpoint? Yeah, so a couple things. Um, definitely building upon what you guys both said. I think uh, way too much friction in the process. Um, like we need to alleviate that. Like I, I think there's also even with just like ETH as it stands, I think like ETH2 will be really exciting just from a mm, perspective of like um, transaction times. I think all this stuff needs to be happening in the background. Think about the innovation of like buy with one click on Amazon, right? Like we're still way too many steps. Um I think the other thing is and like one thing we have to that point. Remember that Amazon took like 15 years to introduce that buy now button, right? Like, like, and nobody was like, oh my God, where's the buy now button? It was like, oh, it introduced it. Great. Amazing. It's a future, yeah. right? So it, like it took 15 years to get to that point, yeah, right? For sure. For sure. Um, I think the next thing is, uh, I think one thing, one mistake that a lot of people make in creating their NFT projects, which I think was a profitable strategy during the bull market, but is not the sustainable long-term strategy is like, 
I think there's a, a, a thriving pocket of, of NFT enthusiasts, right? These are what we consider NFT purists. They're actively buying and selling NFTs. Like that, it, it's growing as a pool, but all things considered, it's kind of like a finite pool. I think a lot of people that are creating projects are targeting NFT enthusiasts rather than targeting their respective communities. So I, I think like a um, this is why sometimes you see musicians that did nft drops like even if they were a smaller musician if 90 percent of their fans were into nfts they would have a significantly more successful nft drop than a musician 10 times larger where five percent of their fans were focused on nfts i think we're at the point right now where the, the artists that might be 10 times bigger even not even that big are focusing on really onboarding the 95% of people that aren't interested in NFTs with legitimate value propositions, with seamless user experiences. Um, so I think that's a big thing. Stop just trying to target the NFT periods and really focus on onboarding your specific communities with value propositions they can't look over. The one other thing I'll say too is that I think um, uh, there was a book, I think it was either Lynchpin, but it was talking about um, uh, a shoe brands that um, it was, this is Malcolm Gladwell book, I believe okay. the linchpin or tipping point, the tipping, tipping point. point. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, this yeah. talks about the, the tipping point, which in other like metaphors or words really is this notion of like crossing the chasm where you get to this kind of metaphorical point where it's like the dominoes have fallen, the snowball effect has happened. And this book really deconstructs that. And there, there, there was a story of this like struggling shoe brand that had been operating for years. I can't recall what it was, but, um, they were trying all these marketing campaigns, nothing was happening. Next thing you know, and this is like um, 30, 40 years ago, but like NYC creative cool cat started rocking this inside like clubs and meatpacking. Yeah. And, and gradually this started to have this massive ripple effect in culture. And next thing you know, this brand is, is, is huge. So I, I think one of the reason I love about music and music NFTs and more musicians coming into the space is that I feel musicians have cultural influence far beyond the music that people listen to. So I think we need more culturally influential and this doesn't need to be superstars but this needs to find we need to find these these different pockets of underground culture that have disproportionate influence in mainstream culture like there's people that where we walk down the street where it's like yo what the hell are they wearing <laughs> and then like four five years from now like h&m is like fast fashion mass producing that so we need to tap into those like disproportionately influential underground contingents that influence consumer culture at yeah. large. I think from that from that point around music specifically, I'm so excited and super energized. And I think NFT Now will be there to support whoever this is in any way, shape, or form, a homegrown Web3 native musician that goes mainstream, right? We started seeing so many mainstream artists coming in. Let's go, Heno, Yay! Black Dave, Iman, Latasha, 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 Daniel yeah. Allen, Daniel yeah. Allen, yeah. here we go. You Place know? my hey, bets. Hey, let, let's go, you know? I'm a proud <laughs> NFT holder of all these colors. Yeah. Uh, so from that perspective, like we've seen so many coming in, but what like your point of being at the club, right, of being seeing these things in meatpacking or seeing them in Detroit, right, with EDM, right, things of that capacity. I'm excited to see when that person is going to cross that chasm as a Web3 native artist that just blows the fuck up, right, like top charts, record selling field fooling stadium like selling out like i'm excited for that that'll be a big moment the other thing i think is really important to focus on is the power of gaming mm. uh i think gaming is going to drive the next nft bull run i think that if you look at the market volume and the absolute like market like the, the size of the market just in terms of users the gaming space uh it is such a no-brainer and a sleeping giant uh for its crossover into web3 in the nft space um it were you know, like Axie Infinity was just like a, a tip of the iceberg. Um, and as as this bull market right now, while we speak, so many like AAA games are getting made. So many, so many gaming studios are working on incredible games that are going to drive things in the next year, two years, three years. And the other thing, too, is we also have to play a role. Uh, in helping battle misconceptions there, and and change the narrative um, because there is a backlash against the NFT space in the gaming community. You saw what happened with Minecraft. Uh, you've, you've seen what's happened in, in other contexts as well. Um, 
I I don't think that uh, I don't think we're gonna lose this fight. But but it, but it, but I think that education moment. is important. It's education is important. Yeah, it's a yeah. blockbuster moment. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, never bet against technology. Ne never bet against technology, and never bet against culture. That's right. Because right? this is not only technology. This is technology and culture. Right. Like when you when you think about that concept, it's unstoppable. Right. You know, and I love that. But and, um, and like also, you know, think about it. We we touched on it earlier, but it's like how much time do we spend in games where we had no actual financial stake or like. Or, or real stake in it, aside from just like having fun. The, the games that succeed in the future are going to give you that amazing experience of having fun, collecting with your community, but you'll also be able to benefit from it. Like there'll be composability, there'll be interoperability. Look at, look at Face Clan, yeah. yeah. right? They, like these they guys, know what they're doing. they know what they're doing. They just went public. Shout out to Kai and everybody there. But like, dude, they're, they Shout built Lee. Lee, bro. They built a cult again, another cult following. We we were at the IP uh, at the IPO day, yeah, like Nasdaq I, at the Nasdaq, and I shit you not. I walked outside the Nasdaq and it was a sea of tweens and teens and early 20s mobbed, mob, like wearing the whole red with the face with the going for an IPO, for an IPO. Like this wasn't even an event. This wasn't even like a gaming event. This wasn't a co like a competition. It was them going public, but the community felt so involved and so invested that they wanted to show up. And it was like such a surreal moment that I was like, got it. Yeah. Yeah. Gaming and gamers becoming shareholders. Ooh, that's a powerful one. Speaking of shareholders, let's flip this out a little bit because I know we've been a little bit macro. Let's bring this into the micro. All right. Let, let's talk about our favorite artists. Let's talk Ooh. about like let's get let's get let's go back to where we started. Yeah. The art, right? Yeah. What are some artists? Who are some people? What are some projects? Who are the personalities? Maybe there's some groups that are creating, right? We don't know if X Copy is one or 15 people. We don't really know, you know what I mean? Uh, but like, let's talk about some of the artists that are like highlighting your world that you're really, for lack of a better word, bullish on. Well, I can jump in, I suppose. I mean, look, like I, I know, I know we mentioned X Copy as you know, and making everything Creative Commons. Like, I think that will be, I think that will be viewed very, very favorably by history. I think that was a very significant mo uh, move. And X Copy is sort of that that king of that like medium native like crypto art like movement there. Um, artists that I really like that we're you know just that that have you know been been creating recently and doing interesting things I mean I'm a big Alpha Centauri kid fan um, I loved his collaboration with Searlight another artist that I think has done an amazing job of like bridging the gap between um, their own artistic uh, output and then also creating a community uh, with Capsule House um, you know I, I think that that's a super special um, I love continuing to see incredible photographers Ayla El Musa yes. I, I love what she's doing um, shout out to the nude community that's right <laughs> That's right. Um, look, like what Dave Krugman has done with Drip Drop. Oh my God. Um, bro, with the AI mm -hmm. being able to count the traits instead oh, of creating yeah. the traits, he took the photographs of the traits. It's so cool. And 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 I love if you haven't heard him speak about like his like that that theory that he has, the ring theory of like of creating value as an artist, wherein he has like uh his one of one sort of at the center, and then um he has drive and then like expands it with drip and continues to reward the holders. Like if you own a one of one, you're able to get a drive, and if you have a drive, you're able into drip but it's like but he continues to expand his user base and his, his collector base so it's about inclusivity while also retaining some exclusivity it's really special um you can definitely find it on his twitter he actually talked about it in in one of our panels but like it, it like i love how he's thinking about it I, I also love that he's thinking about it from a, a mycelium perspective he's another mushroom lover and he always uh, recollects mycelium into his approach and it's really interesting right like the most powerful dao in the world is mycelium right yeah. like hands down there's no argument around that cool. and what i love about him from that perspective is how intentional right he does things intentionally like he is not minting photographs left and right right he's not like taking one-on-ones or super rares or things of that capacity right like when i went searching in january for his grail for his genesis piece right like i went on a fucking mission to find it right thankfully shout out to vlad ginsburg who helped me he gifted it to me and i'm really grateful for that but like it was really hard to find it not because we didn't know where it was, but because there were so many limited, yeah. right? And I love that intentionality around a project. I love that community aspect. I love that the drip, where the drip drop was done so well and so intentional. And like his all ships community is also something that he like is so passionate about. So yeah. I know we can have probably we can probably have a whole podcast about him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just because I love. Has him, he not been on the podcast? Yet? I don't. We got to so. get, him, we on. Gotta get yeah. him on the podcast. Yeah, we, yeah. Yeah. we got the, the HQ, we got, bro. Yeah, we got we got, <laughs> you, Dave. We got you, Dave. Welcome to the spot. That's right. I want to I want to also. 
shout out what um, like Vintage Mozart and Ebi Ua are doing with African NFT community. I think they're giving an incredible platform um, to that to that community. And, and I also love each of their individual artworks just, just as in general as well. Um, I mean, I could go on, but you know, why don't why don't let me toss it over to Ali, Sam, one of one of you. I'll, I'll think of like so many more and Yo, I'll probably chime in again. I think for me, and, I, and I, we mentioned this on a on a previous podcast, right? Like Feocious has been larger than life. I think for me, for me, it was like the first time in my life where I met somebody that I actually said he's larger than life, right? And it was really beautiful. Still a huge fan of his work. And what, I'm, that's for context. But then walks in this gentleman, Sam Spratt. Uh, his, his, his work is Lucy. He does these beautiful, finely detailed art that is around this ape. That's really beautiful and it creates a story of Genesis, a beginning, right? But I genuinely firmly believe, and I'm going on record on here, and I'm putting this on my mark. Called shot. Called shot. Sam Spratt will be one of the most prolific artists of our generation. Full stop. The man, the way he thinks about life, the way he approaches his art. Little little people, li people little know that Sam was actually the person who introduced Fuo to NFTs. That's Right. And so he said, look, this is your time feel go right. Guided him, walked him through this process. And now slowly but surely he's implementing. He's has some of the biggest collectors, Cosimo. He's got the punk six, five, two, nine. Yeah. Right. Like I, like he just sold at Christie's at the same price point as people. Right. Like think about that from from the last thing that was uh, to benefit maps. Mm -hmm. Right. So it was really huge to see that level of commitment of that homegrown aspect. There's this other artist that I really love. He has like this concept of flowers with like post apocalyptic concepts. His name is Bruno Orly. Um, he uh, his his super rares went for like a significant amount in Genesis. He's I think 17 or 18 years old out of Germany, right? And, and so what I love about that is that there's this individual who's so young and brings so much beauty. I can't wait to show you guys his art. It's like absolutely breathtakingly amazing. Um, there's this guy, Ronald Dong. I think, it's, let me get his name correctly. I just want to make sure. I don't, and him and I, we've been on the DMs here left and right, but he's just an amazing human being who does some incredible comments. Yeah, Ronald Dong. Um, he does some really beautiful things with colors and imagery around self-reflection. So it's all about how his personality presents himself as an artist. And I just love how cool he is, right? Um, I wouldn't be who I am if I wasn't going to mention some nude photographers and nude artists, you know, because I love my nude NFTs. I, I feel uncomfortable. <laughs> 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 Uh, you know, like, Ayala, you said it, you know what I mean? Uh, nude yoga girl. Um, there's this another anonymous artist that I, I really believe in her and I think she's going to start rising. Her name is Shaivet. It's like super dope uh, human, really great personality. I think authentic expression through nudity is also something that from the beginning of art, we've seen it, right? The Renaissance, nudes are very much real, right? Like we see a lot of this art and I feel like this medium is actually going to be allowing that to come again. And I love that pseudonymity is being celebrated within this element, right? Like you can you can express yourself without having to show yourself, right? Which is really, really something that's very dynamic. Um, and there's so many different artists, I can go on and on and on. But I think the biggest project that I'm most excited about from a collective are two projects. G Money's uh, Admit one, mm -hmm. that was fucking amazing. I'm really excited to see what he's going to do in the business of fashion yeah. and been seeing how he's going to reward his community. That new Web3 fashion di house, di yeah. Di it's going to be amazing. Yeah. And then, Ohm from a Punk Six Five Two Nine, oh, yeah, yeah. like I, that project, Open Metaverse, yeah, yeah, holy shit, right? Yeah. That's gonna be something on that on cyber, yeah, yeah, on non cyber, it's amazing. So those two are the the two like personalities that I feel are gonna be driving, and of course I have so many other artists, so like Claire artists. Silver, like yeah. it's so unfair, right? To like, I, we can do a podcast for like months on oh, just yeah. all the artists, yeah, oh, you yeah. know what I mean? Uh, Daniel Allen as the musician coming in, you know what I mean? Like that was so awesome seeing his rise. We at ETH Denver, he was in the middle of our ETH Denver producing a, a piece of music for you NFTs. Just, <laughs> this the, like on a laptop, like, yeah. like Ableton, and it draw eye to me because that that's like the kind of move Skrillex would do. Like yeah. I, I've seen Skrillex at after parties before, yeah. Just be honest, like everybody's partying around him and he's just like on Ableton on, and I was just like, this kid's like this kid's got like a Skrillex vibe to him. Yeah. And it turns out to be, yeah. And it's on. so awesome. Yeah. Uh, but Sam, I know that you are incredibly passionate about 
equity, equality, diversity, and especially around music. What are some of the, your favorite music artists that we need to bring forward to the table and bring, make them part of the conversation? Sure. Even without that preface, the list does not change. Favorite artist right now, Heno, uh, Iman Europe, I think, doing incredible things, been making music for a long time. I think they, um, from beat selection to lyrics to sound, um, I think they're, they're just incredible musicians that are also at the forefront of the culture and community as it pertains to kind of fostering adoption in this space and really setting a positive precedent for um, how artists can operate in this kind of Web3 music landscape. I think, um, dude, definitely have to throw shouts to Latasha and the platform she's building with Zoratopia. And I think how that's becoming this kind of like touring festival brands like i think even just with our perspective of like fostering mainstream adoption bridging the gap between purists and tourists i think zora Topia is doing that incredibly well right now and just kind of popping up at all these big kind of like nft oriented cultural events but like creating just a, a very welcoming environment um that's just built, going back to what you're, people just want to come have fun like these are just great parties great music well programmed um the kind of booking getting really awesome talent from web 2 web 3 um, so all those artists, I think some of the other projects too, that I just want to highlight is generally like favorite projects. Um, I'd say one is, um, in no specific order here, I think what, uh, Anima, uh, which is Matteo Maleri from the DJ duo Tale of Us, uh, is partnered with Alessio Da Vici, chief curator at Super Rare, um, incredible artist, 3D animator, designer himself, who built this fantastic project which is anima and kind of Mateo's like solo dj act but they've effectively been releasing new songs along with their visual counterparts as nfts selling them as one of ones uh sometimes literally as much as uh, like hundred fifty thousand dollars. um tale of us and, and Mateo and anima are, are no stranger to world-class live event production what they do with their afterlife series is literally one of the most so advanced sick um yeah it's it's, a, it's literally at the like top of the game like up there with like what is like easy doing at his, I, remember, like, I, I, rem shows. I remember seeing them in, in ibiza back in 2017 yeah, 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 and yeah. i was what's, like what what's happening yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. what am i in right yeah, now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did sure. I take too much? this can't be the mushrooms bro. <laughs> <laughs> not, i remember like i remember seeing them play in italy like and yeah. then they're like all of a sudden like the crowds just kept getting bigger <laughs> and like and, like the stage design just kept getting doper like, 1000 yeah, percent yeah. so What's fascinating is they are doing a fantastic job at seamlessly integrating NFTs within this kind of crossover realm, right? They're they're like it's behind the scenes. The fans don't even realize that they're watching an NFT, nor should they have to. And right, I think that's part of the beauty of what's gonna, what's necessary at this next stage. It's kind of like letting the technology live in the background. But in, what's happening in the background, though, is that this is actually becoming like rather than this being like a sunk cost of them just like spending nine, ten times more than what the average artist would on production. Now they have this actual like financial mechanism to reinvest into live show production. And I think even down the road with Ividao, they have some interesting opportunities and interesting approaches as how they uh, outside of just these one of one NFT sales, how they want to bring in more of the music community. The two other projects I'll mention that I, I think are really interesting. One is... Um, I think uh, uh, what Miguel is doing with S1C, I think, is a really fascinating project. And there's multiple layers and um, uh, like there's the lifestyle fashion brand component. And he's really kind of I mean, like even outside of any Web3 integration, I'm like, that shit is fly. Like that, that's <laughs> as its own legs just on the merit of like the fashion brand itself. But that's really just a kind of a pillar of this overarching brand, which is unified through a membership pass that also gets access to some of this, the merchandise and clothing, um, as well as access to different events. But what I find to be really fascinating is that S1C is really trying to build this community of different creatives. And I think um, part of the, the proceeds of the NFT membership pass sales go into this treasury. Every single quarter, there's a creative theme and a creative prompt. Members of the community are able to then pitch a creative concept against that theme uh, and then the community effectively gets to vote and every quarter then there's a grant that goes from the community treasury towards these different creatives once that person receives that grant they then do a collaborative drop 
um, with S1C and that artist. So this becomes a mechanism for crowdfunding and, and catalyzing creativity and becomes a mechanism for uh, funding and promoting these projects. I, I think that's fascinating. I think it's similar how like Julie Pacino and Keepers of the Inn is providing a, a yeah. mechanism. That's going to be a game changer for yeah, movies. Yeah, no, for sure. Oh, yeah. and, and for people that aren't, aren't familiar, Julie Pacino, incredible photographer, filmmaker, director. Um, yeah, no, awesome. And she effectively... Uh, took a bunch of photos at one of the core locations of this film she wanted to create, Keepers of the Inn, minted the photography, um, range of different traits, types of photos, but was effectively able to crowdfund a million dollars for the production of this feature film. Um, Pre-doing this, she was going around to different production houses, going the, the Web 2 commercial route, if you will, and everybody's like, um, okay, but you're going to have to alter your creative vision this way. You're going to have to sacrifice that. And she's like, no, like I want to do what I want to do. I have a creative vision and I have a community that wants to support. So she um, got the support from her community and is now in a position where she doesn't need to sacrifice that. And I think like that to me represents some of the most beautiful potential of this Web3 technology, democratization, being able to fund and create for your community with your community and sharing the success um, of that growth right alongside your community. So yeah. Those are a couple of projects that strike core with me. I think one of my favorite, I have to, you reminded me of this about community. The best project, it's one that includes simple math. Like, and it's the most beautiful mathematic equation. 1D equals 1B. Okay. <laughs> I knew you were going to go there. I knew you were going to go there. Shout out to my Gooch Island. Um, I love crypto dick butts, man. I think the community, the, I'm, I'm a fan of the art. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a the holder. The power of memes. The power of memes, man. Like that has been an institutional aspect of the internet culture, right? Crypto dick butts is a representation of something that happened in like in 2006 or something along Definitely those lines. long before well, any of this. Right, yeah. and like it showed up on Reddit. But one of the things that I love is the community around it, right? There's so many people rallying around this community, creating different aspects, right? Like. Meltem. Let's talk about Meltem really quickly. <laughs> the queen of Gooch Island, we right? Like, we love Meltem. She put together a crypto dick butt ball, right? And like, it was like the who's who showing up, having a blast again, coming back to having fun, right? And I think those elements of having fun and sharing in that value is really, really awesome. And again, it just comes down to simple math. Mm -hmm. 1D equals 1B. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> well, I remember when uh, when Anima was doing his uh, his like sound uh, sound test. He put a crypto dick boat up, right. yeah, up on that up on that huge screen. Uh, but I, you know, as, I, as, as, as I we were chatting, you know, so the worlds yeah. collide. The worlds I gotta collide. chime yeah. in real quick though, because I was I was like. I was like, bro, during the live show, like, you got to do it. He's like, should I do that? I was like, <laughs> for the record, bro, like, just so you know, there's a bias. Like, I'm definitely going to not be the person to not tell you to do that. <laughs> like, he's like, that's a good point. It's, it's, like, it's like that meme where it's like, when you have to tell your friends, but I don't know, though. Like, <laughs> yeah. They don't ruin their lives. Like, like you know. <laughs> bro, I, I still think I would have hit, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bro, I'm bro uh, we took that outtake, right? And I oh, shared yeah. it within the, the Crypto Dickbutt chats. And oh, yeah, the, we like, put it up on NFT now. Bro, yeah. that, that went fucking... <laughs> Oh yeah, like, people you know, love that. Blue, bro. Like, I want to. I want to give a quick shout out though, like some artists who came to mind while we were chatting. Um, I, I have to give a shout out to Diana Sinclair and Drift, ooh, not gosh. only for their own incredible work, but for what they achieved this year with digital diaspora, um, supporting artists of color and really creating a, a very important event and showcase um, that that drove culture forward. Uh, I also want to recognize the incredible Tezos art community. Yes, uh, FX Hash, oh Zancan, Zancan has wow. just been doing such incredible work and on uh, besides just being beautiful beautiful artwork and like generative art at its finest like a real champion of that format i really believe tezos community is going to be it's going to have its moment oh, yeah. and i think it's really being built around the art so fully agree on that matt and and i also want to shout out uh john carroll like J -J -J john um who's just been like a stalwart uh, on that on that side mario klingeman and the ai art side like like there are so many amazing artists who are building on tezos and what i love about it is the accessibility. The fact that uh, there's nominal fees, it costs almost next to nothing to mint, to, 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 to purchase, to, to, to transact. And so what it's done is it's removed the barrier to entry for so many artists, especially in developing countries. And you can actually sell art for, I bought art on there for 20 cents. I bought art on it for like five cents. I bought art there for $20. And what's amazing is being able to collect there from a place of pure appreciation, like you know, being free to the financial calculus and still being able to wait and to do it in a way that actually supports artists because you know $20 is a lot 
to an artist in a, in a poor area of the Philippines. You know, $20 can be a, you know, a lot to to an artist in a, in, a, in a bad area in India. Like, and these artists are able to mint there and are able to make uh, to make what can actually be life changing money uh, in, in like proper patronage. Um, and uh, I also just want to shout out uh Snowfro for what he has built with art blocks. When we look when we look back at this time in art history, generative art is going to be closely associated uh, as a major movement of this time. I know that generative art has has existed before NFTs and all that, but it is it is reaching a new level of creative uh, output and also mainstream acceptance. And he has provided and he has built like the leading platform to support that. Um, and he's just the sweetest, nicest, like mo like human who has like the best interests of everyone at heart. 100%. I always say this is no froze world and we just live in it. You know what I mean? He's playing, he like, he's playing 5D chess. Like he's thinking about this generative art platform from a completely different standpoint. And I also want to highlight something about Drift. His addition was able to provide money for criminal justice reform. His, his story around his criminal justice journey of being falsely incarcerated and all these different things, he went back, right? How many people do you know that say, I went through hell and you know what? I'm gonna use that hell to create something beautiful, generate revenue and bring that revenue back. That was amazing. So selfless. So awesome to see that capacity. And I just love seeing that um, from that perspective of how much how many artists are giving back. Like I also got to give a shout out to the Woody's community. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, the Woody's community has been doing a lot for the environment. It's a low key project. It wasn't. It was a community that dropped last year. Customer was involved in it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so like they're giving back to these aspects. So I'm starting to see a lot of these concepts that are coming back and giving back. And I also say like the Tezos. I actually between me and you guys, like well, all of you. Uh, <laughs> And the whole world is listening. World. <laughs> <laughs> Off the record. Yeah, well, on the record. record. Yeah. <laughs> no, th th this, is, this is also our first podcast together. This is why I'm always like between us, right? Um, I have a deeper emotional connection to my Tezos art. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Don't ask me where it comes from. But I remember when we first saw High Sinton, right? Yeah. yeah, like when it came out, right? I remember that. It's my ESL guys. Okay, okay. English second language, okay? English second language. I mean, even even native speakers of English had trouble pronouncing that <laughs> shit. <laughs> so I remember those days where they were, had the free mints and we would meme each other with like the, the, just going through the thing. Oh, yeah. And, like, and it was just so beautiful. And like when you buy one of those things, I, I remember buying, I went one day, two Saturdays ago, I tweeted out, send me, you send me your art, I'm, I'm looking to spend. And I, I spent a couple hundred bucks, like mm -hmm. it wasn't much, right? Yeah. But then I started spending on artists that hadn't sold. And my DMs came in. And immediately I'm able to put food on the table for my family. Oh, where are you, where are you at? Hey, Ukraine, mm -hmm. oh my God, you just helped me be able to move my family from Ukraine to the situation because of this thing. I, that, I was short X amount of dollars for the flights. This art piece did it, right? Or the other ones that are like, hey, you're giving me validation, right? Like, holy shit, I was about to stop producing NFTs and then you just bought it and now keep going, right? But there's that relationship in Tezos that is so human centric that I'm just so excited for Tezos to have its moment. And I feel like it's gonna be building up quietly and rumbling, oh, yeah. you know? Yeah, like I, you you have this comparison. It's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I always say like Tezos is the Berlin of NFTs. Like, it's like, it's dark, it's gritty, it's cheap, it's sexy. It's like, it's like, it's a lifestyle choice, you know? And it's where the best, and it's where a lot of like the best shit is, you know? Like, and it's, and, and I always say like, like, you know, if if we flipped a switch and you know we got rid of transaction fees on Ethereum, we uh, you know would cut down on the environmental impact, all that, people would still stay. Th th that community would still stay minting on Tezos because that's where they're. That's where that community is. Like it's it's about more than just like an accessible blockchain. It's a culture. Yeah, one thousand percent. Well, uh, uh, one of the most fun part of our jobs is that we just get to like showcase and shout out and help put on and shine more light on projects we're inspired by so it's uh great for we're able to do that together here and i think every single day constantly showcasing uh what we feel to be setting a positive precedent within the space so um as you do come towards a close um real quick rapid fire 
what are some things that you guys are excited about in the next uh, six to twelve months as it pertains to NFT? Now, let's let's give a little alpha. What's what's coming? Um, tokenized media. We've said this. We're continue to do it. Um, we have some game changing things, but I think I can't really share much details. But I'll give you the questions that we're asking. How can we drive value back into the community? Right. Instead of extrapolating the value, how do we bring it back? And so that's where we're starting to think about the tokenized media concept. Um, the NFT now membership has. I'm excited about that. Same. Um, but really, what what I'm really most excited about from this perspective is the team that we're recruiting for NFT now. Like we're starting to see some incredible talent wanting to change the concept of media, right? And media and culture, because it's so important to drive that narrative. So all of our team members that are joining us, you know, I can't really tell you guys, but we hired an amazing CTO who's going to be helping us build the future of all this stuff. So that's what I'm excited about and seeing how we can continue to empower the creators of culture with this. I've always said NFT now is not about us, but it is through us. And we want to make sure that we continue elevating the projects, the voices and the creators who are building this ecosystem. 1000% completely agree. Uh, Look, like I always say, like the last thing we ever wanted NFT now to be is just a traditional web two media company covering NFTs. Uh, It was important to meet the masses where they are and meet people there because we have always wanted to, our mission is to empower the creators of culture and to help bring NFTs from niche to mainstream. You don't take it from niche to to mainstream without meeting the masses where they are. But our larger vision of rethinking and redefining how media companies can create and capture value in Web3 in a community-centric context. Uh, all of the things that we are developing around that, uh, that's what gets me. That's what, that's what keeps me up at night and gets me up in the morning. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> do, do you ever good. sleep, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> Here and there. Yeah, Here and there. Yeah, yeah. Mostly and, on flights. And, and for me, and, and yeah, second everything that was just said, uh, without getting too deep too, running back the gateway, our Basel this year, it's yes. about to be a damn movie. Ooh, I call. think uh, really just trying to, I always ask ourselves this question, like what can quite literally be this like immersive gateway and just leave people uh, crazy, inspired, especially our Basel, one of the, it's such a massive like cultural event. It's been great to see the, the NFT and Web3 representation, but go back to what we were talking about earlier, how there's just these like pockets of culture that have disproportionate influence in broader consumer culture and trends. Like a lot of those people in different communities are at Art Basel far beyond just what's happening in Web3. So I think for us, it becomes a really awesome opportunity to put NFTs in a very inspiring light to these tourists and, and kind of unleash some of the influence that they have to unleash the the true potential of how NFTs can bring power back to the creators of culture. So, um, and on that note, yeah, if you haven't already, definitely please don't hesitate. I wouldn't be doing my job if I'm not plugging the newsletter, but honestly, we do this for you. Uh, every single week, we digest everything that's happening in the NFT landscape into kind of actionable breakdown so you can stay on top of what's happening in the space, nftnow.com. There you have it. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week. Peace.